just uh, this is Miss Lady's letter to me for doing it for us, and I've done one for her and him, and this is a personal card of Mr. Lagan's to me for the room on it. And this is a, a week's work out at Virginia Tech where we've made a hundred pieces of art, and they just got back from Florida, and uh, I talked to her uh, three weeks from eight o'clock till dark, 21 days, and uh, they paid me for teaching them my kind of art. And they're selling my kind of art. And, uh, and the universities from coast to coast has had me for workouts to show them how to do things like what I'm doing. And I got a piece out on a man's driving three hours to get it. If you want me to, I could bring it out here and let you take a picture of it before it goes. Yeah, I yeah. like that. I'll be back in a minute. Okay. And when y'all get ready, we'll have to just sort of shut everybody out a few minutes. Okay, we're ready whenever you are. All right, let me get that piece if you're going to make your pictures too. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Sometimes I just talk about the vision of the world. Can you talk about the vision? Yeah. Yeah, I can talk about the vision. Let me get my mind go. Uh, That's, that's, that's terrible to break down with old age when well, I can really reach the world and people trying to help me reach the world live for it. Yeah. I'm staring up for religious minds of humans. I'm working on infidels. Infidels that don't believe in nothing. I don't even condemn them. They're part of our country. That's our religion. I don't try to change them. I just tell them where I'm headed and where they can go and what they're missing. That's what I tell them. That's the only way you can know. I think the world is ready for a turnaround, and I think my work is going to be part of it. Is this yours or is this Karen's? This is Karen's. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. You don't mind if I take it. Right down there. Oh, well, we can pick me up right here. Yes, send it up there. That'd be good. See what it's doing there. Yeah. 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 Keep a jug half froze full of water, uh, ice in there, and you just pour water in it, just carry it around We all day, and you have cold water. So if y'all want some cold water, we'll fix a jug of ice for you. Yeah. Yeah, that thing there, I could sell enough of them to finish this garden with. I could make them. I could sell any amount of stuff I could make. I could sell a hundred times more than what I could make. There's such a demand for my work that it's impossible. It just, I just have to hide and isolate away from good friends and galleries and everything and turn them away for I ain't got nothing for them. I've got seven galleries now that's got a few pieces in them. Yes, sir. And uh, I, uh, uh, everything I do, like the devil and his wife and uh, the little uh, dinosaur like I showed you, there's kids all over the country having fits for them little dinosaurs. And I do art for children, I do art for old people, uh, and my infidel friends, they come here, they'll pick up a piece of my work, say, Hart, we like your work, all right, but we don't like that Jesus stuff, so they don't buy it. So I keep them a few pieces without uh, any religion on it, because I how want you, them to have some money. How do you feel about doing that? Does that well, work? I feel like that's a, my human duty. See, I, I, I'm not really from this world. I was sent here on a commission. I'm commissioned to reach the world. I didn't come here for no certain parties. I come here from I come here for everybody. I'm, 
I come here for everybody, just like Christ come here for everybody. And I don't remember where he ever mentioned about Jonah and anything. He just come here and he worked with the whole world. But Christ emphasized more on sinners than anything else because it says God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. See, Christ didn't come here to condemn the world. Christ come here uh, to save the world. And I can't condemn people because it's wrong. The Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. I have millions of sinner friends. I have thousands of infidels, atheists, Buddhists, all kinds of people that love me because I don't condemn them for what they are. I wouldn't try to change them the more than I'd try to change my black dog into a white dog because they're all Americans. And we all Americans. And I'm not here to condemn or to judge. I'm only here just to love people. There's a lot of people who dies without love. When you get to where nobody loves you and you think you haven't got one person that loves you, well, you're the most down and out person in the world. I mean, you could go crazy. You could kill yourself. You could do anything when you wind up with nobody that loves you. And I try to love everybody. And I try to help everybody that I possibly can. When I was a little boy, and I first began to read, I laid down on the front porch and opened the Bible up to the crucifixion of Christ on the web. And I read that, and I cried, and I thought to myself, my God, why would they treat anybody like that for anything? And I couldn't, I couldn't understand it, it just bored me. And I said to myself, well, one thing I'd like to have done is been there and give him a cold glass of water. Well, later years, when I began to pass the churches, I found out, you know, that I could still give him uh, that uh, glass of water. And uh, he said, as much in as you did unto the least of these, my little ones, you did it also unto me. So we find that uh, I wound up giving everything I have uh, to people. My whole garden, 24 years work, $250,000 of my own saving is all tied up in the garden. Well, what do I get out of it? I get to see little kids pick their first fruit from their mother's arms. I get to see people here by bus loads from all over the country come here and eat grapes, blackberries, apples, anything I want to eat out of this garden. I get to see people come here that gets away from their jobs without paying out all they made. It costs nobody nothing to come here. And I, I give my whole life, my garden and everything to people, and I'm a man of vision. I'm not really of this world. I can't adapt to this world. There's too much misery in this world. There's too much sorrow in this world. When there could be all kinds of happiness and joy in this world, this world's a land where milk and honey flows. This, this world, uh, I, they ain't one story that I've found nowhere in Florida, New York, or nowhere. I can't even find one story that hadn't got milk and honey in it. We're living in the land of milk and honey flowing. And what we're doing is that we're doing worse things than they've done in Noah's days. And I have visions of this world. And uh, then uh, the, the people here uh, should be uh, shouting and praising God, and they're miserable. They're miserable in the land of milk and honey. They're miserable with money. They're miserable with good jobs. They're miserable with the blessings of God all over them. They're miserable in a land that's been fought for for over 150, 200 years. They're uh, miserable in a land that... Uh, Millions of soldiers in America has died for the uh, church and the Bible and the freedom of this country. And they're going around uh, just miserable and uncontented. It's because they don't have Jesus Christ. It's because they don't have a hope in another world. They're down here trying to get everything they can and snatch it out from one another's nose and all such as that when they ought to be on their knees praising and worshiping God and thanking God for this planet. 
I started having visions when I was three years old. My sister from my dad come to me at three years old in an old mill road, which would be a long story to tell you. And that's the first vision I had when I was three years old. And I've been having visions since. I go to these big universities and they'll say the earth just formed itself. Well, I had a vision going in this earth, about 4,000 miles down in this earth, and I find this earth that is blueprinted, carefully engineered through the 6,000 years, that it's full of veins. This earth is a body full of veins. All of the limestone water is separated. All of the mineral water is separated. The salt water and the fresh water is separated in this earth. The coal has its deposit, the stainless steel, the uranium, the salt, everything in this world, the coal, and the crude oil, and everything has it. It has its own veins. This world is carefully engineered and made for our environment. And then they go teaching, and these universities just formed itself. And I come up in these universities. I've been to universities from coast to coast. I flew all the biggest planes we've got. I even got pictures of me in the cockpit of all the planes with the engineers and all kinds of books and everything. And every time I go to a university, a big university, to meet with the supers, and meet with the bosses and everything. But I haven't understood that when I go to a university or anywhere, I don't want nobody teaching me nothing. I come here to talk, not to be, I, I come here to talk, not to listen. I come here to teach, not to be taught. Because I have the vision. And then they say that people come from monkeys, which couldn't be far, farther away from the truth. That monkeys, if people come from monkeys through 40 billion people, some of them would have little tails on their knobs. And then a monkey has never in one time in history built his own house. That's how foolish he is. That's how kid-like he is. And the ants build her house, the squirrels build her house, the geese build her house, the birds build her house. A monkey has never built his house in no history of time. And then we come up here with all of our... Uh, technology like we've conquered the ocean, we've conquered under the ocean, we're conquering space, we made the computer, we made the typewriter, we made the music instrument, we made everything and then them set up and said all come from a monkey which never has learned to say it's ABCs. It's impossible. And I'm here to straighten this world out. And if they get our young people to, to thinking this earth formed itself, and they get our young people to think that it comes from monkeys. They've done away with the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. That's what they've done. They've done away with the book of Genesis when they teach such things as that. And it's that in the Bible, if you take anything away, your part will be took out of the long book of life. I'm not here showing off and smarting off. I'm trying to save somebody. I'm trying to save our educators. I'm trying to save our universities. I'm trying to save our nation. I'm trying to save Russia and China. And all of the countries, I'm trying to save them by trying to get the fact of the truth out that all men come from one blood of all nations of men. And my vision of other worlds, sometimes I go out of sight of the sun into the real twilight zone. When I was in Lehigh, Lehigh, Lehigh University, I said to them, I said, you all know a lot about this earth, but I said, I have to know a lot about my vision. And I says, I go out of the light of the sun sometimes. The light of the sun gets, uh, the sun gets as little as the end of a match stem. And there I am in the twilight zone, just halfway between daylight and dark, looking out there in space back at the sun. And then I have visions of going into this earth and seeing it. I had a vision going to hell, planet hell, walking over planet hell, seeing people there I know, or no dog and talk to them there. And that's a bad place for anybody to go to planet hell. There's not one green plant on it. Just smoky hills, no lash piles. People sitting around just like as drunk here and yonder. It, and I, I've been there and had a vision of it. And the Bible said in the last days he had multiplied men of visions. He said in the last days Young men shall have visions. Old men shall dream dreams. It says in the Bible, without a vision, the people will perish. I have the vision. I have the vision of another world. I have a vision of more than this planet. I have a vision of hell. I have a vision of how the earth's made inside. I have a vision of the great God, the creator, that created this universe, the greatest engineer that's ever been in the galaxy is God. 
and then I have visions of people here on earth I've been working with them uh, people on this earth uh, misunderstand me uh, it seems as though I'm a well known stranger on this planet because people think I'm crazy I have the real vision people think I'm crazy I have the real story people think I'm crazy until I have become a well-known stranger, a walk in the highways of this world, and flying your craft, uh, riding your buses, and going into your universities, and seeing what you're teaching, and seeing what's going on in the world. And this is the most awfulest thing that I've ever experienced in, in any history, is to find a world in the land of milk and honey and oil and everything, and now they're starting fighting over the oil fighting over the iron ore, fighting over the land, fighting over everything like a bunch of wolves in the middle of the forest eating up some poor something. And all of them should be worshiping God. All of them should be every night getting on their knees and thanking God for every breath they breathe because every breath they breathe is direct from God. And there's no history where God ever gave but one breath to this human race. And this human race right now, by the millions, is a living off of one breath of God, because that's the only breath that's in their record that's ever given to a human. And they're living off of that one breath he breathed into Adam. It's seated down, just like the oak tree is seated down. That one breath seated down, just like the sheep seated down, the dog seated down, uh, the orchid seated down, the flowers seated down. And that's the way it is. That one breath of God seated down through the centuries. That's the only breath this old world's ever had. And this world, dumbly, to me, is, don't even realize that. They don't realize that all of them is breathing from one breath of God. And that makes them part of God. Every human on this universe is part of God from his breath. His breath is eternal as he's eternal. And when, the, when he made man in his own image, he made him out of clay. That was the first Adam. And when he made that first Adam, just like our ceramics make things in these universes out of clay, God with his own hands, and we're the only thing he ever made that lived with his own hands, and that puts us especially above animals like monkeys because he didn't make them with his own hands. And so God made us with his own hands he made a nose with no smelling in it. He made eyeballs with no seeing in them. He made a tongue with no taste in it. He made a brain with no memory in it. He made a body with no feeling in it. And he made uh, ears with no hearing in them. And then this sound you hear coming from me right now is one of the invisible members of a human being. The seven invisible members of a human being come from a breath of God that's called a second Adam. I don't hear the preachers talking much about that. The first Adam was a house for the second Adam. The first house would have been nothing on a form, but when God breathed in that first Adam, that become a second Adam. Smelling come in that nose. Seeing come in them eyes. And Adam, feeling come in that body. Voice come in that body. Taste come in that body. Memory come in that body, and Adam become a second Adam from the breath of God, which made him part of God, and everybody came from him, and all people are part of God. And the world don't understand that. They think of for a Baptist, they are, they think of for a Catholic, they are, they think of for this, they are, they think of for that, they are. Nobody's all right unless they know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, points you to one thing. And that's a door to heaven. And that door everywhere in the Bible is Jesus Christ. God gave them two little, one little commandment. There's a test. They broke it. Then God, uh, he gave them little animals to offer on the offer. And they started offering them to old idol, just insult to God. He gave them ten commandments and they broke down and was burned up. He was trying to draw us back from the fall of Adam. He comes on down. He sends the prophets. And them people stone them holy prophets. Everything God sent here for a man, he just destroys it, throws it back in God's face. And then finally, after the prophets, you remember, God said, well, 
I'll send my only begotten son. Surely they'll reverence him. And that's the last thing God ever done to try to save this world is to send his only begotten son. That was more than Ten Commandments. His son was more than little lambs on the altar. His son was more than the prophets. His son was God Almighty here on earth. And they sent him here as a last remedy. And when Jesus come here, they miserably destroyed him uh, doing miracles. They miserably destroyed him, raising the dead. You just imagine if you're sitting here and I say, I used to say a word or two and your little brother from a dead, uh, from a dead would ride and come and walk in that door and you say, how did you raise my little brother from the dead? You would have fits. You, would you kill a man like me for raising your little brother from the dead? Would you? Well, how did they do it? That's, that's, that's why I can't adapt to this world. How did they kill a man that was raising the dead and healing the leprosy of their whole bones and uh, making one loaf of bread into enough to feed 5,000? How could they kill a man like that? How can anybody be stupid enough to kill a man that could make uh, feed 5,000 people off of a few little fish and bread? How could they be stupid enough to kill a man who's healing the leprosy? How could they be stupid enough to turn loose a thief a good man like Jesus and crucify him. Listen, lady, that's the last thing God's going to do for this world is Jesus Christ. Now, they, other people might get there some other way, but Howard Fenster cannot get to heaven without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the door to heaven. That's the last thing God ever done for this world. It's the last thing he will ever do to save this world. And he's made it so plain to Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man come to the Father except for me. And more than that, he said, if you try to get up any other way, you're the same as a thief and a robber. I'm not here to condemn the devils. I'm not here to condemn nobody. I'm here to tell people actually God's truth, that Jesus Christ is the last thing God done for this world. And if they don't get there through Jesus Christ, uh, according to my Bible and according to my visions, nobody makes it without Jesus Christ. I don't care what they are. They, they write me from England and all over different places wanting to know how to make it to God. They studied religion. They studied this and they studied that. What can I tell them? I tell them, I say, I don't care what you belong to. I don't care what you ever belong to. There's only one way to get to heaven and that's Jesus Christ is the door. And I said, man, get Jesus Christ first and then join whatever you want to. But be sure you get Jesus Christ because that's my message. And that's not my message. It's God's message. That message was here when I was born. That message is here when I was three years old. That message is here when I had my first vision. That message has always been here. The people just seem too stupid to pick it up and realize that that's the last chance this world's got. And that's what the preachers ought to preach. They ought to preach Jesus Christ is the last chance this world had because it's the last thing God done for this world. And listen, God's not going to always strive with people. God says, vengeance is mine. And God says, I will repay, saith the Lord. And there uh, never been no history of time when people got away from God that they didn't, uh, a judgment come up on them. One time, the, the animal, like a dinosaur or something, come up on them and destroyed them. Now then, judgment's coming up on this world. The prophet said in the last days, a fierce whirlwind shall uh, come from the coasts of the earth. And that's our tornadoes uh, right now developing in our own eyes, spoken of 2,000 years ago, that these fiercy whirlwinds would come. Now they're here. Last night in North Carolina, uh, I don't forget how many people killed. That, that town was into a rebel because of a fiercy whirlwind that the prophet spoke of. It's on us. God didn't send me here to say, hey, Christ is going to be born. That's not happened. God sent me here right in the fulfillment of the prophets to tell them, the prophet's saying is now coming to pass. You're stupid. You're, you're a dreaming. You're a sleeping in the land of milk and honey. And the last of the prophet's fulfilling. And you're just moping around and don't even know nothing about your creator. Don't know nothing about the world you're after. All you know about is everything that you can get a hold in this world, anything you can enjoy here, because they ain't looking for nothing else. They don't believe in nothing else. And that's the most disturbed person in the world. Somebody that can't look to something besides this life. We only have 70 average years here. I would never settle for 70 average years because that's how old I am right now. 70 years. And 70 years is just time to hang your hat up and put your coat on and get ready to go into the real place where people live. 
Because this is not a planet of life only. It's a planet of death. It's every moment somebody's crying. Every moment somebody's shouting. Every moment somebody's born. Every moment somebody's dying. Every moment somebody's groaning. Every moment somebody's having a good time. And that's the kind of world this is. I can't adapt to it. I'm not out of this world. I was sent here from God. And I'm as a second no in the world to relate the facts of God's truth and let the world know where they're standing. And let them know they are of the world. Why, when Jesus Christ comes here, I don't see how people could be so stupid to not believe in another world. Jesus Christ come here. He didn't come from a chicken house. Jesus Christ come from one of the most greatest and populated planets in the galaxy, the galaxy where God is. Jesus come from an inhabited planet. And when he got here, this is the second inhabited planet Jesus come to. And he said, if I go away, uh, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I'm, you may be also. And he mentioned, Jesus did, a building, a new heaven, and a new earth. Not where God is, not where we are, but the third inhabited world mentioned by Jesus that I'll build a new world and a new heaven wherein dwelleth righteousness and no unclean thing will enter into it. And I had a vision that Jesus is making this new heaven and earth that will make this place ashamed of itself. That he's making a new heaven and earth and it'll be reserved for his bride and him only. Not because uh, other people are not welcome, but the rule is no unclean thing will go into that planet. It's a planet that he's making for him and his bride. And I had a vision that when he gets ready to salvage this earth, that Christ will take his people and they will be the first ones to go in that new heaven and earth, just like Adam was the first one to come into this heaven and earth here. And when he takes us into this new heaven and new earth, walking in for the first time, God's people, it's never entered their minds or heart what God has in store for them. It says, I have not seen, ear have not heard, neither is it in the heart of man what God has in store for them that love him. You're saved by loving God. You're saved by believing in Jesus Christ. If you're justifying yourself for the law, you've fallen from grace because grace and truth came with Jesus Christ. We're not living by Ten Commandments to get to heaven. We're not doing nothing to get to heaven except believing on the last choice God made to save us, and that's Jesus Christ. We can't get to heaven on being a Methodist or being a Baptist or following tradition. We can't get to heaven on nothing but the last thing God done for this world, Jesus Christ. And that's the way it is. That's the way it'll always be. And those that don't listen to me, it's just too bad because I have the vision. And the Bible says without this vision, the people will perish. And my God, you know that people will perish fighting in the land of milk and honey and killing one another and everything else. And the very strictest religion people in their churches. I've pastored 10 churches and I hadn't pastored a church yet, but what the ain't two parties in it? Churches split. He says, the prophet says, kingdom should rise again in kingdom. The Catholic some will change. The Presbyterian, the Baptist, the Church of God, all of them are gradually changing into something what they wouldn't when they first started out. And he says, kingdom shall be against kingdom and nation shall be against nation in the last days. He said, in the last days, he says, he says uh, they will turn from the truth and turn to fable. Now, fables is nice. I, I relax by looking at fables sometimes. I like them. But he says they'll turn from the truth to fables. And I, my grandkids right now, some of them would turn Billy Graham off to see Mickey Mouse. That's what I'm talking about. We're in the full film of the prophets, and they shall turn from the truth, and they shall turn to fables. And another says that men looking upon one another, and the apostle Paul, he says they will leave the natural affection of a woman. Just imagine a man walking up and looking to a beautiful woman like you and saying, uh, just turning from your natural affection made for him and say, I'm going with that man instead of her. And it says they'll burn in their lust one towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemly. That's what they said would happen. It's happening today. Men want legal rights to marry one another. The prophets is fulfilling. Howard Bester's here. They wouldn't listen to Christ. They wouldn't listen to Noah. 
They wouldn't listen to the prophet. They wouldn't keep the commandment. And if they turn Howard Fenster away and turn Jesus away, there's no hope for people like that in the world to come. There's two places that uh, you check off in this world. The only two places I know of in God's Bible. One of them is you check off here and go to your reward in hell, or you check off here and you go to heaven as your reward there. And God don't put people in hell. There's a hedge all around hell today. The, the Bible's all the way around hell. Nobody can get to hell without going over that Bible. Christ's name has been preached all around hell. You can't even get to planet hell until you walk over Jesus Christ. You can't even get to planet hell until you walk over his cross. You can't get to planet hell without walking over your pastor. You can't get to planet hell without walking over your mother's prayer and all the persuasion going on home. When I went to hell one night and walked through it, what did I see? I seen people that nobody could get to understand nothing. And the time they got to where they could understand it was in hell, too late, too far away, and they couldn't do nothing about it. Why? God didn't send them. Our God never sent nobody to hell. Hell, God made hell for the devil and his angels. That's who it made hell. God didn't even make hell for his people he created by his hand. They dig into hell. They spend a lifetime going to hell. They turn the preacher away going to hell. They turn their mother away and go to hell. They turn their wives away and go to hell. They turn everything good away even to get to hell and they press into hell. And that's just a shame that they go to hell and look back and point and say, God sent them there. When God plainly says, it's not his will that any human should perish, but that all men should have eternal life. That's God's will. They even go over God's will to get in hell. They do everything against God to get in hell. God never sent nobody to hell. God never will send nobody to hell. These grievous people that's dissatisfied and, and milk running off of their tongues and honey running out of their ears are going around wading into hell over the blood of Jesus Christ. Going into hell over the greatest love that the world ever had. I don't know of one human on earth that lay his life down like Jesus did and die for all the people. And I'm like Jesus. I'm here for all people. I'm like Jesus. The only thing different than me and Jesus, I'm just one of his disciples late getting here to tell about the prophets of fulfilling. I'm nothing but just uh, an instrument of God here in this world. I can realize how little I am. I can realize what this country is. I can go and we keep honey out of the store in our home. We keep milk day by day out of the store in our home. Me and my wife knows we're living in the land of milk and honey. And we would enjoy it so much. But here comes in something. Uh, your grandkids done this. Uh, or your brother-in-law's dying with cancer. Uh, your sister's fixing to have an operation. And uh, we could enjoy the land of milk and honey. But we're covered up for us like that. We want you to pray for us. Tell us how to get the help. That's getting too much for one man like me. I can't tell that story to everybody. If the millions of TVs and magazines and books don't get my story out, they're going to have to answer for it because they're the medium in which they reach this world. And if they don't take me out to the world, they're going to be responsible for it. TV companies, rich companies, great companies. My God can destroy any TV company he wants to now if he sees fit. My God can put any magazine out of business if he wants to because he said, his, uh, he said that, uh, uh, that as you was better off uh, with a millstone hung around your neck and cast into the depths of the sea than to even offend one of his little ones. And anyone who works against me are working against the last prophet fulfilling tell. Anybody that works against me is working against one of the last great messages that everybody has to hear. People have to hear me and hear my message before the end of time because they don't know what I know. Preachers don't preach what I preach. Why? Because they have their work. It says abide in the calling. We're in your call. Nobody can do Billy Graham's job. Nobody can do these pastors' job. Nobody can do the government of God's job. And nobody can do my job. And I'm here with my job. And I know what my job is. And I'm telling the world 
I'm not coming to students. I preach to students and I talk to students all over the United States and they'll give me a thousand dollars for one night just to come and talk to them. And I turn away three appointments a day. I'm too old. I can't make it. But what do they want? They want to hear me. What do I tell them? And I look into the, a bunch of young people and I'll say to them, I say, I'm not come here to take nothing away from you. I'm not come here to push nothing on you. I'm not come here to organize a new religion. I said, all in God's world, I'm here to tell you I'm a man of visions and I have visions of other worlds. And if you miss this other world, you're going to miss everything, Fred fellow. You're going to miss everything. And I say to these students, these young students, I said, this body is the only body you got to put your education in. Your body is a house. It's a house for anything you accumulate. I said, if you go kill yourself on cocaine, trying to get an education and spending somebody's money, I said, if you're taking cocaine, you just about to quit right now because you ain't gonna help nobody to put your education in. You can get a top degree, you can get a master's degree and come up with an old cocaine-stricken body. Your education ain't worth nothing to you nor nobody else because it doesn't get a house to even live in. That's what I tell them. There's nobody as hard on people and get as close to people as I can get to them. Why? Because I have the vision from God. We have missionaries. We have evangelists. We have pastors. I'm a man from God. I'm a man with the visions of the last day. The last of the prophets is fulfilling. And one of the prophets said in the last days that children will turn against their parents and put them to death. And that even the parents would turn again their children and put them down. That's been happening over seven years. Of course, a little all down, but it's getting worse. And they, the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's what people are saying in their hearts. They can go to church and be an infidel. They can be a good citizen and be an infidel. They can be a minister and be an infidel because they don't believe in their own living God. Well, does that give us a right to blaspheme them? Does that give us a right to entertain them? Does that give us a right to hurt No, that's the people God's people are supposed to love. The closest human to hell is where the church ought to have its heart set right now. And uh, I don't have anything against the churches as far as that's concerned. But when they have their own fun, they have their own body, they have their own group, they have their own suppers, and that's all you see them. But my Bible teaches me when you have a supper, call in the poor, call in the lame, call in the cripple. Do you ever see a church have a big dinner and say, we have this dinner for the sinner. We have this dinner for the pale-faced kids. We have this dinner for the rolling chair patient. We have this dinner for them suffering people. You ever hear a church have a supper like that? Do you ever hear anybody have a supper like that? No, they can't raise money helping the crook. They can't raise money uh, feeding the sinners. They can't raise money uh, asking the poor in because they got no money. So let's have our own money, have our own suppers, have our own group, and let the world go on to hell. That don't work. That's what I'm here for. This world needs to turn around almost on a 45 degree. We've got a lot of good people in the world that don't even know the story about reality. They don't realize that they're a second atom, a living soul. And uh, that second atom, when God breathed in him, he raised up, he, there was sight in his eyes, or smelling in his nose, there's memory in his brain, it's all demonstrated right there in the garden. Even the feeling of fear and everything was in him. And then we come down to us today you have eyes and you have a sight in them. And nobody can see that sight. The doctors can't get an x-ray picture of your sight. They can't get an x-ray picture of your smelling. They can't get an x-ray picture of your taste. They can't get an x-ray uh, of your memory in your brain. They can't get an x-ray of the hearing in your ears or the taste in your tongue. So therefore you have a second atom that comes from the breath of God which is the seven invisible members of a human being, which is the seven churches, which is the seven days in the week. This world to me is off sight. They're lost in a wilderness of forgotfulness. They're looking forward to stuck in the dark.
when they can be looking forward to step into the unbelievable city of God. And anybody that's dying right now, this man that's dying right now, I've been going there of the night. I've never in my life heard him say, oh God, but now he's dying with cancer. And he's saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, help me. Oh, and he groans and he's suffering all night long until he gets uh, morphine in him. It's pitiful how he suffers. And I knew him about all of his life. And it's the first time I ever heard him call on God, uh, my friends, in my life. It's for the last few days I've been there. Now, I pastored 45 years. I've seen hunger. I've seen nakedness. I've seen sorrow. I've worked for 10 cents an hour. I've had a hard time in this planet. It's not been easy for me on this planet. And it still ain't easy for me on this planet. And it never has been easy for me on this planet. I'm daily sacrificing my life and my time and my music and everything I got. I'm daily sacrificing it to the world for the last change, for the last go around. If I could get even 95% of the people to believe in the Creator, this world might last. 10 more thousand years. And like many be, they had one they had one nasty message, and 40 days God said, I'll destroy you. And when they got that message, every one of them repented, come down on their sackcloth and ashes. The kings come off of the throne. Everything happened. Everybody got saved. And God went back on the, uh, the thing he said he'd do to them. After their reaction, he went back on it, and he spared everlasting one of them. And that's a preview of Earth's planet. I don't never come here preaching that this planet is doomed. I'm preaching that this planet will come to God like many of you did. God can reinstate this planet from the fall of Adam. God can make this world we're in now an eternal world. God can easily reinstate this world we're living in and make it a heavenly world. He could preserve it and take all of the things out of it that would destroy it. If all the humans here would come to God like Nineveh did, oh, God is the same. God would do for us what he done for Nineveh. And on the side of my house is the children of Nineveh standing out there that I draw them. They're saying that Nineveh shall rise up in judgment again this generation. Why will Nineveh rise up in judgment again this generation? Because Nineveh had one message and they heard it and they repented and they all come to God. We have 10 or 15 messages a day. We turn away. We turn our radio off of messages and turn to something else. We turn our pastors off and listen to something else. We turn everything off religiously and listen to some of us else. I've been watching my own family that I raised up in church. My kids are growing up. They turn any kind of religious program off they come to to get a cowboy store or anything else. Now, let me tell you, I'm not uh, an extremist. I think I like cowboy stories. I like any kind of story that has, makes sense to a human. But there are a lot of stories on the TV that's dooming and damning the world, and they'll have to pay for those stories that come on there. And they'll have to give an account for ever, all the deeds done in their bodies. But what I'm saying to you, the Bible said in the last days, I'll turn from the truth and they'll turn to faith. And I tell you, anything that you make your God, that's where your trouble is. I heard an idiot on the TV one night get up, and he said, uh, well, says, here's all this stuff that money will get. And he says, that it, uh, it's a root of all evil, and here's what it gets. He was protesting against God's word. God's word never said that money was the root of all evil. Ever hobo and ever tramp, and everybody has to have money. And it don't say that money is the root of all evil. Where he misquoted it was, and he'll have to give an account, is his protesting against God's word with a false of scripture. The Bible does say this. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself. God had rich people. Jesus had rich men. And Abraham was a rich man. God don't call you out for having property and money. What calls you out is that you just love money so good until you poison your own little daughter for $25,000 insurance. That's what it's talking about, the love of money. That a man will actually, he loves money so much, he'll poison his little baby to get $30,000 insurance. That's what the Bible is talking about, the love of money, not money itself. By God, if he condemned money, we'd all be gone. But now nothing. God wants you to make money. Most of all, God wants you to know what to do with money. 
And all the people I ever seen that was rich come to disaster was people that didn't know what to do with their money. They give it to things that wasn't worth a flip. Like $15 million to rock and roll singer that's already rich and me here uh, working on the easel board trying to finish a $250,000 garden with my bony hands at, at 70 years old and no rich people in the world has even felt like they wanted to give me enough to finish this garden or come here. Uh, I had a few little weaselly donation boxes and the kids broke into them of a night and got what little change I had. 